Good evening and welcome to the weekend news. I am Kojo Kwafo. Coming up in the news tonight, the leader of the NGC party in parliament, Honorable Dr. Kande Kole Yumkela, uh, lauds the judiciary of Sierra Leone for what he called the fair judgment and his dual citizenship rights to contest for presidency and other political positions. President Bill reaffirms his commitment to build the capacity of men and women of the Republic of Sierra Leone Armed Forces. And the Anglican Diocese of Freetown completes three days training for teachers of Anglican primary schools in the capital. Well, these are most guys lined up in this edition of News Hour, but first our coronavirus preventive message. You see where them people are where they mask them fine? Well, now so you self for wear your mask. Cobra you no send you much autumn for you day near other person. Now the leader of the National Grand Coalition Party in Parliament, Honorable Dr. Kande Kola Yumkela, has commended the judiciary of Sierra Leone for what he called fair judgment by the Supreme Court on his dual citizenship rights to contest for the presidency and other political positions. He was speaking to members of the National Grand Coalition Party at the party headquarters in Freetown. Jonathan Turner reports. Hundreds of stewards of Dr. Kande Kole Yumkela's party the National Grand Coalition gathered to listen to their parliamentary leader after the Friday ruling between Alfred Fauna of APC and Dr. Kande Kole Yumkela on his eligibility to contest as member of parliament for constituency 062 in Cambia districts. According to Dr. Yumkela, the judgment was new done in the justice sector of the country, noting that the ruling did not only exonerate him alone, but for thousands of diaspora Sierra Leoneans that may want to exercise their democratic rights. He stressed that even though the matter was delayed for over three years, the judges demonstrated professionalism and independence in their judgments to thank the legal team. Very professional. We put the evidence together and diligently agreed to face the Supreme Court. So I want to thank them for their professionalism and their wisdom. To the rest of Sierra Leoneans, look, struggles are difficult. Sometimes some of us have to stop for others to be better. And in this case, it is my belief, it is my belief, that if you want to be president, you must give up your second, uh, uh, your, your door nationality at that level that's why i did it i was victimized they went after me but it doesn't matter this is a time for forgiveness this is a time we need to heal this nation to bring all of us together honorable dr kande kole Yunkela called on young silenians to unite and build a nation together noting that peace and cohesion could lead to sustainable developments for slbc news Jonathan Tona reporting. President Julius Madabil has said that the government would not relent in building the capacity of men and women of the Republic of Saturn Armed Forces and was committed to ensuring adequate investments in basic domestic training as foundation for advanced professional training. The president made these remarks during commission in parade of 60 cadet officers who are now recruited into the Republic of Sierra Leone Armed Forces at the Armed Forces Training Center at Benguna and the Western Rural District. Our senior State House correspondent, Arma Se, describes the event in her following report. Thank you. 
This was the scene on a beautiful Friday morning at Armed Forces Training Center, Benguin Barracks, where 60 newly recruited officer cadets were commissioned by President Chidesmada Biu. These young, energetic men and women will now start the ball rolling in the Republic of Civilian Armed Forces after undergoing rigorous training. Professionalism is not an option, according to President Chidesmada Biu, but it is a way of life for an officer, and as it is also involves discipline, loyalty, respect, compassion, and character. Officers, he noted, must demonstrate these qualities in how they lead and how they live, do more, learn more, and serve with honor without giving excuses. The commander-in-chief congratulated and reminded them that they were soldiers first and always and must never allow themselves to become tools in the hands of politicians because their duty was to protect the peace, democracy, and support national development. But this is the the level of the we are we are three months ago. One the Royal Air Force And the other one is the Royal We have put the more women into our armed forces over the past two years. Our recruitment of women is part of the threshold specified in the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. My government has been guided by our women in gender equity and the recognition of the critical role of women in the future of our life. The president commended the country's development partners for their great support in building the capacity of the Republic of Sierra Leone Armed Forces, especially the United Kingdom, the United States of America, People's Republic of China, France, Canada, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Egypt, Ghana, Russia, Pakistan, Turkey, Liberia, and Guinea, to name a few. Over the last three years, he noted his government has engaged new and existing partners and advocated in the best interest of the ASLA for training and equipment needs. As a nation, we have a long tradition of men and women, of these armed forces, have demonstrated the of war and all over the world.
updated again about the entire process. The commandant of the Peacekeeping Mission Training Center, Colonel George Mahmoud Bangura, recalled that nine months ago, a couple of officers was selected out of numerous applications from different parts of the country and had successfully gone through the officer cadets to direct entry commissioning courses. Colonel Bangura congratulated the officer cadets for making history for themselves and the peacekeeping mission training center, adding that their mandate was to train our staff personnel for international peacekeeping operations. From the ball we see during their training and the parade we witnessed today, there is ample evidence they, they have been put through the mills and have come out well refined. When, when the, the Peace Mission Training Center was started to train these young officer cadets, we saw an opportunity and a challenge. It was a, an opportunity to train young leaders from our institution's future. The challenge was the instructor's ability to train soldiers and civilians from basic soldier skills to competency and leadership. Because the instructors of the Peace Mission Training Center are traditionally akin to specialized training for peace operations and other professional development courses. Officer cadets were also awarded in different categories, ranging from the Best Military SA, Best Female Award, and overall Best Cadets. Officer Cadet C.Y.I. Masuba was recognized and celebrated for her outstanding performance and with the best film military essay. SBC TV News are in Freytown. Her Masuba reporting. The Education Department of the Anglican Diocese of Freetown has completed a three days training for teachers of Anglican primary schools in Freetown. The workshop was geared towards reinforcement of teachers' code of conduct with specific reference to leadership, performance, diligence, growth mindset, and the ability to teach effectively. A reporter, Mohamed Kuruma, with this occasion. This engagement was held in a bid to climax a three-day workshop organized by the Education Department of Anglican Diocese of Freetown. The initiative was also an affirmation that teachers play an integral role in the development of every nation as they are the foundation for quality education. Teachers are seen to be mentors, thus they need to own their skills that will enable them to do more work professionally. That is why it is essential for them to be trained regularly, especially with regards to their performance, diligence, leadership, growth mindset and the ability to teach effectively. The Education Department of Anglican Diocese of Freetown decided to thread that path by organizing a three-day training session to enhance the performance of teachers in various Anglican primary schools. Members of Rising Academy, we are the key facilitators of the workshop. What we did, um, government will be bringing uh, interventions of building more schools, bringing books, uh, school furniture. But the main cause in order to get the educational problem is to deal with the teachers. So what we saw is that we had to bring solution by training teachers. Because when once you train the teachers, you take them to the classroom, then they implement what you have trained them, then your problem will be solved. One of the participants expressed delight for the training session. She said that the training session would help to improve performance in their various schools. Thank God for the Anglican Education Department. We have learned so much. The code of conduct for teachers, we are highly deliberated on. Information is power. So indeed, we have come now to receive power. We are well armed now to go and reinforce what we have learned. The diocesan education sector and Nicole emphasized that teachers we are expected to increase their performance after undergoing the training session. She stated that they would ensure that such program continued even though finance had been a challenge. Around. I don't only sit here to employ, I am also a supervisor of the schools. And we are going to put things in place 
regulations sent out to the head teachers to supervise because the leaders too have a role to play. Whenever we go and we see something is going on, we might warn. If they don't take corrections, we will quail. This step taken by the Anglican Diocese of Freetown is an effective step towards achieving quality education in Sierra Leone. This is SLBC. I am Mohamed Kuma reporting from Freetown. Over the 21 years, it has been observed that the price of a 50 kilo bag of rice, the most consumed food in Sierra Leone, has increased by 75% in four years, from 200,000 yen, which is about $20, in 2017, to 350,000 yen, about $35, in 2021. This steady increase, according to the Deputy Managing Director of the CTC Community Trading Company, is largely due to freight costs to import bags of rice into the country. Julian Kuruma has been out to ascertain the market price of rice. There are hundreds of thousands of bags of rice in various stores in the Commodities Trading Company stores in Freetown. And according to Khalil Holloway, the Deputy Managing Director of CTC, that is sure to serve Freetown for the next two months till more bags arrive. However, the Commodities Trading Company has halted the sales of rice because freight costs has soared. Now, we are one of the largest rice importers in Sierra Leone at the moment. We are one of the largest rice importers in Sierra Leone at the moment. It is not easy. We have many constraints, starting with freight, going on to foreign exchange rates. This year, the price of rice, the butter brand, which is the most sold brand, started at 250,000 units per bag. Up until recently, the price has gone up to 296,000 units a bag. And the main factor that drove the increase of the price of rice is freight. Now the main factor we drive that push from January to today are the freight and the biggest factor. Fanta Faker is a businesswoman who deals in rice wholesale. She explains how much she buys and sells to retailers. Probably they buy at least that they are priced. But now, any day they add for me. Before now, we used to buy a bag of rice at a very reasonable rate. But recently, we buy a single bag for 295,000 leons and sell at 300,000 leons per bag. We just get 5,000 leons profit, which is really small. To have profit because there is one at daily use, they go faster. A few meters from Fatmata's store is the Kennedy Street Market, where Yabum Kamara sells rice. We're not the only ones hiking the prices of rice. We used to sell the butter rice at 1,500 leons per cup. It went up to 1,700 leons per cup, and now it is 2,000 leons. When the wholesalers raise the price, we increase ours as well. As soon as the commodities trading company sorts out the change in freight costs, they will soon start selling to the public. SLBC News are Julian Koma. Air Senegal has landed its maiden flight with more than 200 passengers from Freetown to Dakar and Dakar to New York and Washington, D.C. But the flight with the sea of Air Senegal, Senegal's Minister of Transport and Aviation, and the Consul General of Senegal in New York, amongst others. Holidaymakers and people traveling with the flight for the first time were excited that such a West African flight has resuscitated a direct flight back Dakar to Sierra Leone. Uh, by traveled on flight and she now reports. A busy morning on board Air Senegal's A330-900 Neo flying from Dakar to New York and Washington, D.C. Passengers are being assisted by the cargo of the first inaugural flight of Air Senegal. Two Sierra Leoneans are among the first set of people who boarded the flight from Freetown International Airport, Lungay. It's a new thing now. I wanted to be among the first people who now see what the service and see how it looks like. I am um, always up for the job. So uh, I prefer, that's why I, I wanted to 
why they are sitting out. Well, I'm expecting not only than the, um, the best of service meeting the aviation standards, policies, procedures, and I would say global practice and international standards. I think um, those are the safety precautions for security that uh, they have to. Senegal is explicitly operating the flight on a watch list basis, which means that an airline leases a plane and crew from another airline. El Hadji Amadou Ndao, Consul General of Senegal in New York, was excited to fly Air Senegal and was hopeful that the flight would make a difference in the airline traffic. On board the new carrier, passengers were impressed with the advanced facility that the aircraft comes with. Um, I may Having a great experience through the years in the Of course, small things like travel around the world, but of course, small things are wonderful. Uh, you can just go back in the sea, it's, it's a nice stretch. So it's like, uh, <laughs> like that. Wow, almost like laying down. <laughs> it has my, it has my first time flying with them. So they got it, I've been really like um, surprised because everything is, is nice. It's like, Upon arrival at the Baltimore airport, there was a groundbreaking launching ceremony by the Baltimore official to formally welcome the CEO together with other dignitaries from Senegal. Today, the way you are hosting this event is showing one of our core values in Senegal. We call it Teranga. Teranga meaning welcoming others. And here we find Teranga. This is very important for our company to come here and this is just the start. I will wish that we'll have again and again more and more uh, frequencies developing our partnership with this airport. Thank you very much. The Washington to Dakar flight will cover a distance of around 4,000 miles. As Senegal is government-owned, so the airline might not even be focused on turning profits on the route, but rather sees bigger value in having a link between the two capitals. The flight between Dakar and Senegal covers a distance of 3,830 miles, whilst the distance from New York to Baltimore covers a distance of 184 miles. The new A330-900 NEO has a total of 290 seats, 32 business class seats, 21 premium economy class seats, and 237 economy class seats. Reporting for SLBC, Hawaii, Washington, D.C., U.S. Meanwhile, the Chief Executive Officer of Air Senegal, Ibrahim Akeid, together with some top Senegal officials, has held a press conference with dignitaries in Washington, D.C. to update business people across the globe about the new career operating via Freetown, Dakar, to New York and Washington, D.C. The ceremony attracted business people and journalists from Senegal and Sierra Leone. The event was held at the Watergate Hotel at Washington, D.C. Uh, so this is our Basi, our Barry, who is part of the media team that attended the conference at the end of the week. A room filled with Senegal's top dignities, including the ambassador of Senegal to Washington, D.C., Mr. Mansour Kane, eager to learn more about this new development for Africans living in the diaspora and at home. Speaking to pressmen and business people, the CEO of Air Senegal, Ibrahim Kane, said he was very pleased with the reception accorded him upon arrival. Currently, this is the first Senegalese and West African flight operating this route. And we are very pleased to share this with as a message before the continent that is just in front of us. For decades, they are in front of us. For decades, we are here in front of this continent without having the right connection at the level of relationship that we can build together. So what we decided is this destination is one of our two major destinations for our company. One is Europe, so we dedicated to this uh, route our biggest, one of the two biggest aircraft we have in our fleet. We have an eight, eight fleet, eight aircraft fleet. The A330 Neo going to Paris, especially. And the second one, we decided that we will be here. Because we 
believe that here is one of the biggest potential we can have connecting not only Senegal to the U.S., but also connecting the whole West Africa to the U.S. He said their main aim is to convince people about how to go back and forth with a new flight. The Senegalese ambassador to Washington stressed the need for quality if the Senegalese carrier wants to make a difference in the air traffic business. The result of this flight is 95% of capacity is filled. So it means in terms of commercial, this is a very real that shows that there is connectivity because if 60% comes inside of Africa, means that it was a link in Dakar. It's why we say Dakar is a hub, because the meaning of the hub is not how many people you bring, is how many people you connect. And we are making, I think, around 20 uh, countries uh, in Africa. The main goal behind the new aircraft is to connect more than 20 countries in Africa. Businessmen applauded Air Senegal for such a brilliant move and encouraged them to make a difference to attract more Africans in the diaspora. A cocktail was later held at the rooftop of the Watergate Hotel to commemorate the landmark event. Reporting for SBC in Washington, D.C., I am Hawa Bari. <laughs> The National Water Resources Management Agency, together with stakeholders in the water sector, has validated the Water Resources Management Coordination Framework. The framework is designed to create a platform for improved coordination towards sustainable and efficient management of water resources. Emmanuel Samoa witnessed the opening of the Mason and Comparative Report. Seated are members of ministries, departments and agencies that directly or indirectly deal with water resources in the country. They are here to validate a water resources management coordination framework document that aims to ensure proper and sustainable management of water resources. It is no secret that the current situation along river banks and the indiscriminate destruction of catchment areas in the country is worrying. The indiscriminate destruction of water catchment areas is seen as a contributive factor to the destruction of the entire water bodies in the country. Director General of the National Water Resources Management Agency, Junisa Patrick Bangali, admonishes participants that if they wanted to see change, they have to condemn the destruction and depletion of water catchment areas. Restoration has so many facets to it. You can restore by planting trees, trees that have been cut off. You can also restore by other means. It's a sad reality that, in fact, we have so many people who are constructing houses illegally in the catchment areas. But as I said, it's a concerted effort. Everybody must come together. Upon validation, the Water Resources Management Coordination Framework is expected to harmonize the wash sector and other environmental policies to include water resources management in the promotion of catchment protection and restoration activities. Emmanuel Samoa, SLBC Frita. The Faculty of Engineering and Architecture at Fairbury College, University of Sierra Leone, has organized the guest lecture series on the topic Planning for a Rapidly Going City. The project, which was funded by the Royal Academy of Engineering in the United Kingdom, was geared towards preparing engineering students towards attaining Goal 11 of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which deals with sustainable cities and renewable energy. Mohamed Kurumai reports that no less than the mayor of Freetown was a guest for this lecture. One of the key areas mentioned by our worship, the mayor, Ivan Akisoya, who was the guest in a lecture series organized by the Faculty of Engineering and Architecture at Fabi College, was on the importance of proper planning of the city. She emphasized that the primary reason for the development of Freetown is rural urban migration, as many people migrate to the city for better opportunities. 
Such situation, according to her, is heightened by poor planning of the city. So the crux of what I talked about was just recognizing the very important role of planning in ensuring that urbanization is effective for the people. What do I mean by that? We have a city that's growing rapidly because of rural urban migration caused by a number of factors. The war was a factor, um, lack of services outside of the, the capital city, countries that Factor. Climate change will be an increasing factor. But in order for that urbanization, for people to be effectively absorbed so that their lives are improved and the city grows and doesn't decline, there needs to be planning. These engineering students are contributors to nation building. Thus, they need to be properly engaged on the attainment of Goal 11 of SDGs, which deals with sustainable cities and renewable energy. For the Dean of Faculty of Engineering and Architecture, Professor Kelek Bauru Mansare, the guest lecture series was an attempt to practice the knowledge students are acquiring in class and to prepare them for the job market. Now we're moving away from, we're still doing some classroom activity, but it's more of hands-on training, experience-based training. And that's why I, we wrote a success, successful proposal to the Royal Academy of Engineering. Very high place body in the UK and they supported my faculty under my leadership to train engineers for the job market and to send engineers on industrial attachment. This active is essential not only for engineering students but the university students generally. SBC Mohamed Koma in Freetown. Now, in these past years, Sierra Leone has been faced with frequent fire outbreaks that claimed lives and properties of citizens throughout the country. Even though the National Fire Force of Sierra Leone has been doing all it can to combat the fire outbreaks, they are still facing challenges due to inadequate equipment. Now, to help salvage the situation, the Christians in Action Mission in Sierra Leone has rated firefighting equipment what millions of leads to the National Fire Force. So, I'm on to report on the handing over of the equipment. We have had calls to fight fires at areas like the Ministry of um, Energy. And believe me, the number of protective clothing at that time in circulation was very, very small. Fire officers who we are there, up there doing the pressure, when they come down, they will be changing their gears, giving them to fresh officers to go. That was the voice of the Chief Fire Officer of the National Fire Force Sierra Leone, Nazi Commander Bongay, talking about the constraints they faced during operations while he was expressing gratitude over the kind gesture by the Christians in Action Mission Sierra Leone during the handing over of the firefighting equipment donated to them. Nazi Commander Bongi also stated that fire incidents are on the increase as they have recorded over a thousand cases of fire incidents. The donation, according to the chairman of the board of directors of the National Conference of Christians in Action Sierra Leone, Abraham Bachelo Matia, is a way of complementing the efforts of the National Fire Force to save lives and properties by combating fire outbreaks. And as part of our watching, we have uh, been able to identify the felt need of the National Fire Force. We are greatly impressed. We are greatly impressed with your activities. But we know that you really need support of this nature. And it is not all the time that government will have to uh, find for its own institutions. We are part of the governance of this country. So we should support state institutions. That's the most why we have gone thus far. Abraham Batilo Matia further said that this will not be the end of their donation. He said the mission will continue to support the National Fire Force and other institutions as their contribution to national growth. SLBC News, Slyman to a reporting. Well, still to come on NUSA, the former managing director of the Sierra Commercial Bank has been laid to rest at the King Tom Cemetery. And the University of Sierra Teaching Hospital commences postgraduate training for obstetricians, gynecologists and pediatricians 
Well, this is more stories. Keep watching news out, Mikko Jukwafo. The former managing director of the Salem Commercial Bank, Adlai Fidelis Tule, has been laid to rest at the Kingdom Cemetery following his death in August of this year. He was 57 years old. Hundreds of family members, former colleagues, friends and sympathizers lined up to pay their last respects to the commander uh, of the Order of the Rukel. Until his death, Mr. Tui was managing director of the Sierra Commercial Bank following his appointment in 2018. He had over 23 years in banking, starting his career at Meridian BIAO Bank as a clerk and then onto Union Trust Bank Silicon, where he left as Assistant Director Credit Administration and Risk Management before joining the Sierra Commercial Bank. Adlai was born in Bonth District on the 29th of January 1964. Sierra ranks among those countries with the highest rates of child and maternal mortality. Figures of the, from the Ministry of Health reveal that over 19% of babies and women die at childbirth every year. This is blamed purely on the shortage of medical professionals to deal with the issue. As Sui Ibrahim reports, the University of Sierra Leone Teaching Hospital has commenced the first postgraduate training for obstetricians, gynecologists and pediatricians at the Order Dewey Children's Hospital in Freetown. The training is targeting seven obstetrics gynecologists and four pediatricians. Obstetrics is essentially the care of women during and after pregnancy. A gynecologist is a specialist in diseases of the female reproductive system and pediatrics is the branch of medicine that deals with the treatment of children. So during rotation, we saw a lot of women dying as a result of uh, pregnancy related complications. I decided after my first job that I will come to this NH. Most people don't want to come to this two facility with this CH because of the workload. But I would prefer to go there and make my own difference. And I even applied for the exam in immediately uh, before the because of the COVID and the extended the exam to October. By then I just had it because I said no matter what I'm going to take this exam and I'm successful. The training is part of a three and a half million US dollars project meant to boost the medical sector in the form of capacity building for doctors and provision of modern medical equipment. It comes mainly under the support of the government of Sierra Leone, Freetown City Council and Mama Pekin Foundation. Currently, um, after they do their house rotations, they send some of them away because we don't have that training in Sierra Leone. In the past, they send them to Ghana, Ethiopia, Kenya, or some of them would leave and go to the US and the UK to study to become special specialists. So now we have our own program in obstetrics and gynecology for pregnant women and pediatrics for children in Sierra Leone. So our doctors no longer have to leave the country. Sierra Leone medical sector suffers from acute brain drain in the areas of obstetrics, gynecology and pediatrics and other specialties. Most Sierra Leonean doctors usually refuse to return to the country when they go for postgraduate training abroad. Hence, the need to commence in-country training of doctors is highly essential. But we want to train people who can go out and walk. Walk and save the lives of our people. If you then decide to be an academic, you can then come out and do fellowship, or then we will be the fellowship after a few years of work and after I do that publish some publications. But that's why we designed the curriculum for three years so that at the end of 36 months, you are up and running and you can serve as a specialist in your sector again for you. And we also made the curriculum in such a way that you can also be recognized in the four regions. Maternal mortality remains very high. Figures from the Ministry of Health reveal that over 90% of babies and women die at childbirth every year in Sierra Leone. About 295,000 women die during and following pregnancy and childbirth every year around the world. Sub-Saharan Africa alone accounted for roughly 196,000 of maternal deaths according to the World Health Organization. SLBC News, Suribem reporting. 
The Minister of Health and Sanitation, Dr. Austin Dembi, has told journalists that the increase in vaccination recently has led to a drastic reduction of the infection rate of COVID-19 in the country. He revealed this during the official handover of the Johnson & Johnson vaccines to the people of Sierra Leone by the African CDC with its development as Joseph Touré reports. <laughs> I would, it is all now my honor to deliver the first um, shipment of the Johnson & Johnson um, vaccine to the Representative Republic of Sierra Leone uh, through the Honorable Minister of Health and Sanitation, Dr. Aston Dembe. The official handing over of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccines was a step that ushered confidence to the health sector in the fight against the virus. It could be called that Brussels Airlines on the 1st of September this year shipped in about 52,000 doses of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine donated by Africa CDC. For the Africa Union CDC representative, the gesture was one of many to come. I would like to announce the shipment of this um, particular 52,800 doses um, of Johnson & Johnson single shot vaccine. And it lets to say much about the, the uniqueness of, of this vaccine. Um, um, the single shot vaccine, definitely. The storage temperatures are also um, well within what we can easily accommodate. WHO boss in Sierra Leone described vaccines as the most powerful tool in responding to the disease. Once again, we'd like to emphasize that vaccines are the most powerful tools against COVID-19 and indeed other diseases. Um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine is highly effective and it is safe, and it will make a big difference um, in the fight against the COVID-19. Chairman Nakovac noted that their focus now is on vaccination amid the promotion of COVID-19 preventive messages. Minister of Health Dr. Austin Demby was confident that with the amount of vaccines available, Decentralizing vaccinating a large scale of the population is possible. So this is the best time. This is the best time to prepare for any next week that's coming so that we're able to contain it even before it starts. And the magic to that is our vaccination. So we're very grateful to the African Union for offering us the Johnson & Johnson vaccine which is a little different from the others because the others you have to give one vaccine and you wait for a while and you give a second booster vaccine to get the maximum effect of your vaccination. With the Johnson & Johnson product, you have one shot and you get the required uh, vaccination level that you need. He was hopeful of having more vaccines soon. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine is the third set of COVID-19 vaccines, including Pfizer, Oxford, AstraZeneca, that Sierra Leone has received from its development partners since the outbreak began in March 2020. SLBC, Joseph Tue, reporting. Well, meanwhile, nurses attached to the COVID-19 treatment center in McKinney have called on NACOVAC to address issues pertaining to the risk allowances. The nurses said there have been no regular payments of risk allowances since it was established in 2020. As Hassan Foy reports, the district has not had any case of hope for almost two months now. So if we don't suffer with a risk we like in a we could at the end of the day expect this morning we are risking our lives to do the job and payment not forthcoming. It's really heartening. A concern all of them share with SLBC. They said that we are first promised weekly risk allowance and later monthly and none never happened, describing the situation as frustrating. The others that their matter have been tabled to almost every quarter responsible, but it didn't seem to be treated seriously, stressing now that Nakovac was scaling down, there were worries that their work would go in vain. Dr. Mamed Sheku, Medical Superintendent, Regional Hospital, McKinney. 
and we don't prepare a backlog list. We don't forward that was based on We have prepared the backlog list and forwarded to the case management pillar of NACOVA, and I'm certain it must have been submitted to the agency responsible for payment. It's a matter of time, but it's long overdue. Responding, the coordinator Dikova Bombali Alhaji Mohamed Mugambo Siafa said that the district they were aware of the concerns and frantic efforts have been taken. He added that negotiations were ongoing and he believes that the issue would soon be addressed. As he encouraged them to be patient and remain resilient in the fight, he said what happened was not intended, but related to unseen circumstances. Nah. Because of some a little bit of delay, on uh, we therefore look at the 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 biba. It's due to some delay on the processing of documents. As soon as possible, their monies will be ready. Some have started receiving theirs. Some don't begin to receive the alert. Some don't begin to receive the the something at the bank. This is Hassan Forekama reporting from McKinney. And now for some stories making news in Africa. Ahead of Sunday's presidential election in Sao Tome and Principe, two candidates are vying to succeed Evaristo Cavallo, president since 2016, who has decided not to run again. The president has largely ceremonial powers. He may arbitrate disputes but does not govern. The first round was held without major incidents in July of July 18. The outcome of the vote has been disputed. Carlos Villanova of the centre-right opposition Independent Democratic Action Party led the first round of voting on the 18th of July with just over 43% of the vote. His opponent for the runoff is Guilherme Puza da Costa of the centre-left movement for the liberation of South Tome and Principe, who scored 20.7%. The country is a former Portuguese colony of 210,000 people that is widely considered a beacon of parliamentary democracy in West Africa. Ugandan security forces arrested one of the country's most prominent academics on Thursday for espionage. Lawrence Muganga, vice chancellor of the private Victoria University, was arrested in Brodenide, the main building of the institution located in one of the busiest streets of the capital, Kampala. An amateur video posted on social media, uh, social networks, shows armed men in civil clothes forcing a man identified as Lawrence Muganga into a van uh, known in Uganda as a drone, which is associated with the abduction of government opponents. Social media reports that the Vice Chancellor of Victoria University, Dr. Lawrence Muganga, was kidnapped or false. He was arrested by joint security forces in connection with espionage and illegal stay in the country. Investigations into the matter have commenced. Western diplomats in South Sudan have said the government should respect freedom of expression, including the right to a peaceful protest. The joint statement for the arrest of a normal civil of activists in the wake of a call by a group calling itself People's Coalition for Civil Action, which is allegedly planning an anti-government protest on Sunday. The diplomats said freedom of expression was needed in parliament and in society at large, and the freedom of assembly must also be protected. They pointed out that these were universal rights and shrine in Sudan's transitional constitution. The government had reassured diplomats in July that it respected these rights. Now let's go to our entertainment news for the latest. Hello and welcome to Entertainment News. I'm Simon Tuwe. From dust we came to dust we shall return. Rwandans and Rwandan entertainment industry are mourning the death of J. Polly, one of their top rappers and a key player in the Rwandan music and art industry. According to a report from BBC website, the 33-year-old rapper died in a hospital in Kigali while in jail awaiting trial on drug charges. Well, let's get more on the rapper and his profile. 
Joshua Tunishemi, popularly known as J. Polly, was a famous rapper and a super visual artist. He started painting at age five using illustration books and was also practicing singing in a neighboring church. The 33-year-old late man started music in a child's choir at ADEPR church, whilst his mother also sang in Hosiana choir at the same time. J. Polly was introduced to rap music by his older brother. The late rapper recorded his first R&B track titled Nakupenda with a group they formed called G5 and later released a hip-hop song titled Hip-Hop Game. <laughs> With the help of Lick Lick, a producer, the G5 team met with Bulldog and they formed the Tough Gang Crew, a team that matched street hip hop music in Rwanda with hits like Freestyle, Kwikuma, and Singaho. Tough Gang! Tough gang. J Party, J -Party. Green Passer, Bistori, Bistori, Yabacharuti, Lick Lick, Dakurewa, F2K Studio, Studio. Tough, Tough Gangs, yeah. Sons and team list calling him a cafella. Musi Mabuko may says it on Hana Richera. Mukabi Ronta. Hana Rima say chera. In 2011 and 2013, Jay Polly participated in the Primos Guma Guma Superstar for competition but did not win. In 2014, the rapper signed a three-year contract with Touch Records, a music production house in Kigali, and won the PGGSS the same year, which proved him as the most loved Rwandan artist then. J. Polly was arrested in 2018 for assaulting his wife and was sentenced to five months in jail. The rapper signed a three-year deal with Money Records in 2019 after his release, which never lasted due to violation of contract. On Friday, April 23rd, J. Polly was arrested with 11 other people on violation of COVID-19 measures, which was the last time he was seen in public. According to the Rwanda Correctional Service, the artist passed away at Muhima Hospital after consuming a concoction of aftershave, water, and sugar. Since his death, Rwandans and their entertainers have taken to social media posting tribute messages. Rest in peace, J. Polly, so we meet again. Well, this is all we have for entertainment news. I'm Simon Tuway. Thanks for being with us. From entertainment, let's now go over to our sports desk. Hello and welcome to Sports of Business. I am with me, Abdul Kabir. FIFA Development Manager for Central and West Africa, El Aji Diop, together with the Serbian Football Association, has inspected the approved school site, which is aimed at the development of the official turf project designed by the SLFA to give a facelift to football country. In the international scene, England had a stunning second half in the World Cup qualifying. England sealed their position of power in pursuit of a place at next year's World Cup with a hugely impressive 4-0 victory over Hungary. The match was an absolute delight for the three Lions when they came in the second half. They had an absolute stunning. This clearly ascertained that they are on the way to ensure that they sail through to the next World Cup successfully. And on that note, when this edition of Sports of the Sea close on Abulkadia, thanks for watching. And now to end the news, the main points again, the leader of the National Guard Coalition Party in Parliament, Honorable Dr. Kande Koleyum Kela, has commended the judiciary of Sierra Leone for what he called fair judgment by the Supreme Court on his dual citizenship rights to contest for the presidency and other political positions. He was speaking to members of the National Grand Coalition Party at the party's headquarters. President Julius Malabio has said that his government will not relent in building the capacity of men and women of the Republic of Sierra and Forces. The President made these remarks during the commission in parade of 60 cadet officers who are now officially recruited. 
The President Julius Madabio has reaffirmed his commitment to that capacity of men and women of the Republic of Sierra Leone uh, and Forces. And that's it for news uh, tonight. Also, the Education Department um, uh, of the Anglican Diocese of Freetown completed three days training for teachers of the Anglican Primary Schools in Freetown. That's it for news uh, tonight. On behalf of the news team, thanks for watching. Until next time, my name is Kutu Kwafel. Say bye-bye.